My guest today is Asid J. Malik. Have I said that right? Andy, wow, that's uh, probably the best pronunciation of my name I've heard in a while. <laughs> All right, let's go with it. Um, appreciate you saying that. Uh, welcome to the show, Asid. Uh, if, if people don't know uh, who Asid is, he is the CEO and founder of Jadu, which is a pioneering AR platform for Web3 and the metaverse, and in my opinion, probably one of the more interesting and intriguing uh, Web3 uh, projects going around. Uh, so uh, welcome to the show. I uh, said, so I guess we, we guess we should start at, at the beginning, which is what we always do at the beginning of the show, um, is I'll, I'll get you to introduce yourself. Love to hear a, a little bit about uh, where you're from, uh, your background, and your kind of story uh, leading up to Jadu, because I, I know you've been in AR for a long time. So yeah, just kind of talk us through some of your background. For sure. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm from Pakistan. Um, I think that's an important, very important part of my identity. Um, I lived there till I was 16. Um, and when I was 16, I got this scholarship to go study in the Netherlands, um, you know, which was a uh, definitely a turning point in my life. Um, I'd lived in a very small town in Pakistan for a lot of my life and my parents were both teachers and, you know, at a relatively young age, around 11, I'd gotten really into the internet, making websites, and it kind of had become this, uh, you know, passion of mine at that time. Um, I felt like it gave me uh, a window into the outside world. You know, Pakistan um, can be very... Uh, internalized, you know, you're kind of living in somewhat of a bubble, as most countries are, I suppose. Um, but especially around that time, you know, 2007, 2009, uh, it was a relatively tricky time for the country. There were a lot of suicide attacks and, you know, just a lot of uh, terrorism and just complications, politically speaking. So the internet had become a really interesting escape for me uh, to the rest of the world. And going to the Netherlands, where, you know, I went for high school, um, was this incredibly magical experience because, uh, you know, this high school I went to had people from 90 different nationalities. It was supposed to be this place that was bringing together 16 year olds from, you know, all over the world, uh, regardless of their financial footing. Um, a lot of kids basically got a scholarship. So being there suddenly just, you know, presented me a lot more opportunities and the world suddenly kind of opened up for me in a really, really meaningful way. Um, so kind of graduating from that high school, I took a year off during which uh, I was attempting to build, um, you know, a really ambitious, uh, vague technology product with my roommate. Um, we were very idealistic kind of 18 year olds, um, very excited about technology in the future and very utopic in our worldviews. And um, after a year of doing that, I ended up going to an art school in Vermont. Uh, which was a bit of a, you know, surprising turn because, um, you know, as I said, I was very into technology. So, you know, the art school really happened because um, I, I didn't want to go to to the school for engineering. I think I wanted something new, something that I could, you know, really add uh, to my perspective. And um, so going to this place called Bennington, um, I realized that my peers in this new place were actually very much not into technology and had a worldview that was very critical of technology and you know social media and the things that it had led to for them as young people, um, which was kind of surprising for me because you know I grew up with this idea that uh, you know become an engineer, technology is good, you know the future is bright, all that kind of stuff. So being in school, I realized that I wanted to do work that was not just technologically forward looking, but work that was actually expressive and creative in nature. Um, and that that's really what led me to AR. Um, I tried augmented reality for the first time in the context of uh, an architecture studio. So I was doing some architecture as part of my education and uh, I tried HoloLens in an architecture firm. And, you know, at that time, it was really being used for reference material and very business kind of use cases. And I was immediately drawn to it as a narrative, creative, expressive medium, you know, the ability to overlay virtual things on top of the physical planet was, you know, absolutely magical. And very quickly, I had made up my mind that this was the medium I'm going to grasp and really stick to for a long time. So that's kind of how I landed in AR. 
Yeah. Okay. So, and if that's the case, then I said, you know, I've I've heard um, you kind of tell the story, and and Jake Sally uh, from from Jadu, I think he is your uh, COO. So I did a podcast with him um, last year, and and he told the story as well. But you know, uh, for for new listeners or, or people who really want to understand. Um, the the story of uh, Jadu. I think it's a, a really important piece of context. But so uh, explain um, how you were kind of uh, you know the the genesis or, or the origin story of, of Jadu and what the kind of the original vision was and how it started to really or it only really started to to come together. The the fuse was lit, if you like, um, once uh, you realised what could be accomplished with with NFTs and and how they were kind of one of the the missing pieces to bring it all together. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, actually Jadu existed well before a lot of my other work did um, as a concept. Um, I have these black notebooks that I've been keeping very religiously for the last seven years. I feel like I have 20 of them now and they're all the same thing. I use the same pen. I'm very obsessive with them. Um, But I can trace back the page where I first wrote Jadu and kind of like made the draft or what is still our, our logo more or less. And this was well before I did most of my kind of uh, festival work and a lot of the AR projects that we've done over the years. And the intention always was that we wanted to build this platform, this one, you know, place for AR and storytelling and, you know, AR is an expressive medium. And, um, you know, I, when I first came up with the concept, you know, the time wasn't right. I wasn't right. I, I was in school. We didn't really have the right resources. So we, so we spent the next couple of years really just building a lot of experiences that we were taking to film festivals and, you know, a lot of projects that were experimental in nature that we're trying to treat AR as a, you know, once again, a medium of storytelling and uh, attempting new things, realizing that a lot of the stuff isn't going to reach a lot of people, but the people it is going to reach, it's going to have a high impact on. And so we really spent a lot of time doing that. And really when Jadu first started was uh, two and a half, three years ago now, Um, By this point, I graduated from school, moved to LA, and had decided that the time was come to build this long-term project, Uh, not a one-off experience that you take to a festival and then you wrap up, or not something that's seasonal, something that can be built on top of for a long period of time, because in order to develop a new medium, I think iteration is really important. You build something, you learn from the things that don't work, you improve it. So... Uh, Jadu was conceptually always, you know, an attempt at bringing richer forms of AR-based storytelling and experiences to a larger audience. And it also marked our shift from headset-based AR to mobile AR. And so we attempted, we started working on Jadu, and at this point we were basically, you know, doing these very realistic holograms of various musicians. We were working with Lil Nas X and Serena Williams and We got to work with a lot of, you know, interesting artists. I actually got to build out my network in LA and a lot of my friendships in LA because of this project, because I got to meet a lot of interesting people whose holograms I was building. Um, And kind of, we were starting to get to a point where this version of Jadu was starting to take off. We were getting, you know, more app downloads at some point when we worked with Lil Nas X, we were top 30 apps on the app store, which, you know, it's something. (laughs) For an AR app uh, that's not Snapchat or Niantic or Pokemon Go, um, that was, you know, we were proud of that. Um, But this is a lot around the same time when NFTs were starting to kind of become part of the conversation. And, you know, we found ourselves very uh, entangled in the idea of Web3 and NFTs quite early on. Um, A lot of our team didn't have some crazy crypto background or anything. It's really the NFT aspect of it that attracted us to it. So Mac, who's on my team, um, you know, released a project with Grimes that did really well as an NFT. And then I ended up directing my first music video that we ended up releasing as an NFT for Pussy Riot, which ended up actually selling for half a million dollars. Um, And the same video made $500 on YouTube, if even that. and I, I believe it's still the most expensive music video ever sold as an NFT and will likely continue to be to hold that title for a while. Um, so when we put that out, you know, by this point, I'd realized, all right, um, for AR, none of the business models make sense. You can't really do ads because ads require high frequency. It requires users to be using this thing again and again for the ads to really be worth anything. Um, and we didn't want to build AR that 
you need to use all the time because that's just not natural for the medium in my opinion you know it's not like a mini game you're playing it's it's higher impact you you feel more intensely when you do it but you don't want to do it all the time um it, the kind of in-app purchase or location-based experiences it was the same thing you know this idea of clickbait becomes important you're trying to convince someone to buy something and more focus goes on the convincing than the actual quality of the work so the ar thing was really attractive because sorry the nft thing was really attractive because it felt like there are new ways of capturing this value uh, it felt like we had an opportunity to build really compelling experiences that people go and do this compelling experience and the experience leads you to an object that is an nft and the if the experience is compelling enough there is a myth that is created around this object which gives it value and i really this this model is incredibly attractive to us because it encouraged good work and encouraged good experiences if you make a really compelling experiences your nft has value if you don't it doesn't and we really love that framework and that's really what attracted us to the space yeah, very nice. Okay, and and I think it would be uh, also really good to understand, you know, why you are so, I guess, uh, committed to AR, why you've chosen this path. I understand, you know, that is your that is your background, um, but you know, when when a lot of people, particularly say from outside of uh, crypto or, or web3 or, or blockchain or, or whatever uh, when they um, imagine this idea of what we call web3 or the metaverse you know they have a a, a slightly maybe slightly unrealistic um, vision in, in their mind of, of what that is and obviously you know the, the easy reference point is to go to something like ready player one or something like that a really um, highly futuristic completely immersive vr world and look Asad, I'm sure we'll get there one day, but you know that world is is a long uh, time away. So I, I love to understand, you know, um, your your view on why kind of like AR is the first one of these technologies maybe to hit some kind of um, Web three inflection point. So it's like just love to understand, you know, AR versus a VR versus XR, or how how you think about this and and why AR is is the one at the moment. Absolutely. Yeah, so I think there are two aspects of this, right? One is why is AR more interesting inherently? And that's that's a topic I'd love to speak about. And then the second is why is AR more urgent? And so first of all, you know, um, when I was figuring out what do I want to do next, uh, believe it or not, the first thing I picked was brain computer interfacing. I bought an EEG headset and was messing around with that. And very quickly I realized this is way far from being realistic in any meaningful way. I spent a whole summer working with an EEG headset and really like best you can do is like two or three inputs out of it, you know? And that felt very limiting. Um, but what was obvious was that the next step, sorry. <clears throat> yeah, so um, what felt obvious to me was that the next step had to be more immersive. And space was a really critical component of this. Um, so we had to basically grasp onto a spatial medium. And in terms of spatial mediums, there were two options. There was, um, sorry, my throat is actually acting up. Um, let me, do you mind if I just grab a glass of water? And no, just, of course, uh, of course, go for it. Just, just go. Yeah, so. You know, when looking at immersive mediums, it was obvious to me that the next step was uh, spatial. You know, the space, uh, that, you know, third dimension was really critical. Um, it felt like the obvious next step that this information that we're used to consuming on a flat rectangle will somehow have more of a spatial nature to it. Now, the thing with virtual reality was, um, first of all, the culture around it, right? Um, because you can, you can start seeing uh, the qualities of a medium uh, with what people start creating with it immediately. So um, when I was looking at film festivals, which is really a, one of the places where you could find VR, um, one of the reoccurring themes was this idea of the empathy machine. You know, people called VR the empathy machine that, you know, you can put on a VR headset 
you can experience something that's foreign to you and you can somehow understand it uh, in a deeper and more immersive way. Um, so when I would find myself at film festivals like Tribeca and Sundance, you know, you would basically have experiences uh, in which let's say you're watching a 360 video um, in which you're transported over to a refugee camp in Syria. And you would in most circumstances be a relatively well off, relatively progressive, um, you know, uh, a person living in a large city in the US. And um, coming out of this experience, you would come out with what I thought to be a delusional sense of moral superiority in which you feel like you now know what it mean, it, it feels to be in this person's shoes. And that just didn't sit well with me. Um, it felt like it was once again, you know, escapist in nature it was trying to kind of create this illusion that you now know more. And uh, AR, on the other hand, felt a lot more tangible, right? Because when you put on a VR headset, you go to some dream world and you don't really have a very direct path of where this place is. You don't have any geological, spatial kind of idea of where this place is. But in AR, your space is the space, right? It's very anchored in reality. It's so anchored in reality to the point where your reality is actually more important than the augmentation. The augmentation is just adding to your view of your world. So the, the, the qualities of the medium were way more interesting to me from an artistic perspective, because you know when I place, let's say, uh, an image of someone in this room um, and view it through AR, even when I take away the AR and enter this room tomorrow, I still have this ghostly presence of this person left in this room because it's anchored into my reality. And that felt a lot more interesting and powerful to explore as a medium of expression versus you know, complete abstraction take, being taken away to a completely removed space. So this is how my fascination with AR started. Um, obviously over the years, it's developed into uh, you know, a, a more, uh, a deeper idea and probably has tied into some kind of commercial instincts and whatnot as well. Immediately, uh, first of all, it was really like an artistic reasoning. Now the commercial instincts is really, uh, you know, the fact that augmented reality is actually available right now on a billion devices, right? The phones people hold in their pockets um, increasingly are becoming more capable to run really interesting forms of AR. Um, you know, LiDAR sensors are becoming more affordable. You know, uh, the cheapest iPhone by next year is not only going to have LiDAR, but it's also going to have, you know, much more significant computing power where we now can do just really solid plane tracking and you can start adding multiple game objects and in multiple interactions running in one moment. And suddenly the types of things you can do in AR immediately right now are actually quite novel and expensive uh, compared to VR, which still remains you know something that a couple million people have and out of those couple million people a very tiny proportion of them are also going to overlap with people that are interested in the type of content we're making or the type of experimentation we're doing in terms of community in terms of blockchain so this is why i think ar as a medium right now is absolutely ripe for really interesting compelling new things that just not enough people are attempting right now yeah, uh, and I, I actually uh, I relate to that, Asad, because, you know, um, listeners should be aware that um, uh, Jadu make, um, as well as this kind of big vision that they're building out that we'll talk about in a second, you know, uh, Jadu have already uh, released kind of these AR-ready digital uh, jetpacks and hoverboards, uh, which are ownable, of course, as NFTs, and I myself, I own a hoverboard, right? And and last year, I upgraded my iPhone. I said I had an old, uh, I think, uh, an iPhone nine, and uh, it was starting to um, die on me. So I was like, I'm, I'm going to get a new phone. And during the course of my research, you know, the new Apple, new iPhone at the time was iPhone 13, and I was reading through all the specs, and it said, I can't remember what you probably know what it said, but it said something like. Um, 
LiDAR AR capable and I was like okay well this is the phone for me because it means that I can I'll be able to uh, fly uh, my Jadu, Jadu uh, hoverboard uh, with my fluff or, or whatever and of course engage in uh, this this wider vision uh, that you guys are building out and we'll talk about the AVAs is, is that how you say it that are coming up soon but before that you know you used to talk about the Miraverse is it, is it still the Miraverse uh, is it or, or have you kind of evolved it from now what is the kind of the the big um, game uh, if you like that you guys are, are, are building yeah so um, you know the Miraverse uh, you might uh, it's interesting that you ask if we have evolved it because uh, you probably have noticed subconsciously that we're saying it less um, correct and you know, yeah exactly so I think uh this is a larger thing that we're going to get into, honestly, in a couple of weeks. I'm not going to um, maybe uh, discuss it too much. Um, sure. You know, long story short, yes, there is kind of a new way that we're starting to frame it now, um, which, you know, we're going to be releasing a trailer and a couple of things over the next couple of weeks that'll start to really give people a sense of how we're thinking of, you know, this place and this, this world and, you know, how exactly it's described. Um, but, you know, I obviously um, would still love to talk about the world, you know. Um, we've been doing a lot of work on this over the last couple of, um, honestly, the last year or so at this point, because jetpacks and hoverboards were, you know, they both represented a form of experiment, right? Like when we did jetpacks, uh, it started off as a very simple idea. The idea was, we had put Amoeba, which is really the first asset I purchased for this reason. Uh, Amoeba had come out; they were, you know, three D files. So we, we, I purchased Amoeba and we brought it into AR and we made it playable. And um, I'm quite confident, and you know, I would love for someone to correct me on this, but I'm quite confident that we were the first to create a playable avatar in AR. Yeah. Um, people had placed avatars in AR before; they'd given them kind of animations before, but but to actually control an avatar running around, I'm confident that we were the first. Now, uh, it, it was a simple idea, but when we tried it, we realized how, um, how important this idea was because AR had always been tre treated as a first person medium. Um, you know, you were the player, you didn't need an avatar, you were the player. Now, when we added this avatar in the middle of you in the world, suddenly your mobility was way more compelling. Uh, not only could you move in space physically, but you could move your avatar in space in relation to you. And this simple addition suddenly made all kinds of new interactions possible. And all we wanted to do with the release of the jetpack was highlight how compelling this new form of playing in AR was. And you know, we thought what better way than to let this avatar not only run around, but fly and you know, make flight like kind of uh, you know, a next step. You can bring in your avatar, you can mess around with it, but in order to fly it, you need to purchase one of these jetpacks. So really that was kind of the primary purpose around the jetpacks. And you know, obviously it sold out in 20 seconds, built the community that it built. Um, and hoverboards was kind of an extension of that idea. Uh, the main concept of the hoverboards was we wanted to expand this community to a larger group of people that we could build this platform with because the whole reason we attempted mobile AR versus headset-based AR was because we realized that new mediums are not developed in some kind of lab or from some kind of silo. You need to develop them socially with people. So we wanted more people to kind of, you know, come to our project. Um, and hoverboards represented more of this evolution of gameplay. You know, we did a whitelisting game that people played in AR in order to get a, a hoverboard. We did these, um, you know, uh, kind of uh, unboxings where people could unbox their hoverboard in AR. Now with AVAs, uh, the AVAs, we're calling them AVAs. Um, short, short for AVAs. AVAs yeah. Exactly, precisely. Um, so the idea with AVAs now is much larger. You know, while we were building hoverboard the jetpacks, in the background, we were building truly our vision for a larger, expansive world that has, you know, qualities and characters and backstory and history and culture and tradition. And our primary purpose has always been, you know, how do you build, um, you know, these forms of communities online that have these things that we're often missing in our 
everyday lives these days. Everything from chance encounters to, you know, things that we obsess with aesthetically and, you know, things that we take our time with, you know, spend time with. These are things that we find ourselves doing less and less in the way our society is currently structured. So the idea was that how do we expand on these ideas that hopefully make people's lives better um, and do so with AR and, you know, anchoring everything we do in reality in a really compelling way. So a lot of the time we've spent over the last months to the year have has involved building out lore, building out characters, giving characters intention and reason and you know, imagining how these things are going to interact with the physical world, how these things are going to, you know, get people to look at their space differently, to build relationships dif differently, engage with each other differently, capture memories differently. So that's really been, uh, you know, what we've been spending a lot of our time with. And that's why we finally feel ready to release an avatar, because an avatar is, you know, a humanoid kind of entity that you can you know, use as your identity to some extent and really play out in this world that we've been building. Yeah, and look, you know, listeners, if, you, if you're just listening to this or, or even watching on YouTube, <clears throat> if, if you're not familiar with what a, a Jadu um, Ava uh, looks like, and look, you know, we've just seen some, the, you know, the, the, the teaser kind of uh, videos that, that you guys have released, um, I said, but you know, you really need to kind of see them to uh, really get an idea of uh, just how how interesting and uh, cool these things are. So I, I'm, my words aren't really doing them justice, but uh, perhaps you can pick up the thread a little bit and just uh, explain uh, a little bit more. Um, you know, I said, what what is a, a Jadu Ava, um, and and what is it uh, capable of? What's the idea here? And then we'll talk about you know how how when they're released, when they're minted, how you can get one, and and all that good stuff. But already, just the the teasers that you guys have released of the kind of the laws, um, the 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 different. Um, yeah, the different kinds here. There are uh, yeah, Circuit Classic Pro X. Um, but yeah, one of four distinct skeletons there's a lot going on here very technically and creatively mm. ambitious is it <laughs> thank you yeah well um you know when we started getting into this idea of building avatars uh obviously we wanted to give it our best and you know make something that was really different and uh compelling but still intentional and not you know thanks for the sake of things and, um, you know, honestly, creatively speaking, it's been a really interesting process. Uh, it's gone through a lot of iteration and, you know, we kind of would have an idea and build a thing and realize it was missing certain things, but certain things were working well. We would then come up with a new direction. And it was a really interesting kind of creative process. It wasn't very simple. It wasn't very linear. And honestly, that's some, that's uh, kind of how my work has always ended up being. Um, you know, you start off on some idea, it's new enough that you end up in some kind of, you know, blockers and hurdles and you pivot a couple of times and you end up with something that just feels very unique and different. And um, I'm, I'm very happy with how the Avas have come uh, together. I think that they do capture something really unique. So um, each Ava, as you just said, you know, first of all, has a skeleton. So we went and we built a skeleton. And the skeleton is something where we wanted it to kind of capture an organic feeling. You know, we want to we want it to reference somewhat of a humanoid skeleton, but it's not a human skeleton. Um, so we have four different types. They're very generative, organic kind of shapes. You know, they have these like um, enclosings that are being formed by these bars that are kind of going around in different shapes. And all four of them have a slightly unique, different kind of uh, uh, quality. Um, there are certain things about them that um, are the same. So they have joints in more or less the same places. They have a head that has, you know, space for display that's more or less the same. And so each of the Avas has a display for a face and uh, the skeleton. Now, on top of the skeleton are what we call these modules that um, attach on top of the skeleton. And really, these modules are what give the Avas their distinct shapes. And there are five different types of AVAs and five different types of modules. And we've given them all names. So um, one of them is Blink. 
Um, blank is kind of cute. Blank is quite rounded, you know, the way it comes across. And uh, from a backstory and personality perspective, uh, Blink is very caring and, you know, has a lot of regard for life. And, you know, a big part of Blink's motivation is, uh, you know, to protect life. And then we have Ruckus. And Ruckus is a bit more industrial. Um, you know, the, the qualities of Ruckus are a bit more blocky, a bit more kind of strong and solid looking. And uh, Ruckus's motivation are on strength. Um, Ruckus believes that, you know, you need to be strong in order to survive in this chaotic universe. Um, and then you have DISC. Um, DISC, we kind of went for an aesthetic that is a bit more ergonomic. It's uh, kind of stealthy in its appearance. Um, and uh, DISC basically believes in exactly that idea that you need uh you know, to be uh, stealthy and you need to be able to kind of, you know, be out of sight if you have to be. And that's an important part of survival uh, for DISC. And then you have Eve and Aura that are the other two Evas. And once again, uh, you know, we're going to be revealing Eve and Aura a bit more over time. Um, but as I said, all of these have these various motivations. Well, yeah, and you've just on the the Jadu Twitter, which is at Jadu Avers, um, you just released a, a video of, uh, you, it says, disc caught staring into the desert sunrise. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, to me, like, disc looks like a kind of uh, futuristic silver... A Western cowboy um, kind of uh, mm -hmm. avatar. Maybe that's just the background because um, he or she or they, I don't know what is a pronoun for an Ava these days, um, but they are kind of ro roaming around literally in the desert as the sun is coming up. And it's just, um, yeah, it's really uh, striking. So just go to the, the Jaru Twitter to, to, to see that video because you, you need to see these things um, to believe them. <laughs> right, I said. Probably. Yeah, I, I actually recorded that video um, over the weekend in Joshua Tree, um, which is, you know, a desert uh, near LA. Um, I was there over the weekend, just, you know, caught every sunrise, caught every sunset. It was a really lovely weekend and, um, you know, had the Avas out as well. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. That sounds like a, a fun weekend. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I just wanted to kind of comment on what you were saying about the Western kind of uh, look sure. for DISC. Um, so uh, I think a big part of what gives DISC this Western look in this video is actually the hat, which is kind of a cowboy hat inspired yes. uh, situation, which, um, you know, you'll notice that all of the AVAs that we're releasing have head traits. So, you know, we have one of the traits that we're going to have for AVAs is actually headwear. Um, and we have various types of headwear that we're building out uh, in the background. We have things that look or mimic hair, but are actually metallic. We have things that mimic something like a cowboy hat, but once again, you know, they're made of metal. And these head traits actually are interchangeable. So, you know, obviously it's a large collection. So um, all the Avas are going to be unique. So you can actually get a blink with a cowboy hat or a disc with a cowboy hat, or a ruckus with a cowboy hat. So their bodies are what determine their type, but their characteristic and their feeling and are determined by other factors such as their expression, their eyes, their mouths, their uh, head traits, and that's going to be you know interchangeable across the board. All right, and so w let's just learn um, briefly uh, about uh the the mint details i guess um i said so how, how many um avas are available um what you need to do to get on uh, a pre-sale list uh to be able to mint one because these are these will be very much um in demand and then after that we'll see if you we can uh, just get uh tease a little bit more information <laughs> out of you as to uh uh yeah what 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 is going to be possible uh with the avas going forward but um yeah so uh what are the what are the details in terms of how how people can get a hold of an Ava? Yeah, so, um, you know, basically we're building 11,000 Avas, 11,111 to be precise. Yes. 
And, um, you know, this is an obvious number to me. Um, it's, we, we, have, we have not hesitated at all on coming up with this number. Um, you know, it's a, it's a great kind of continuation of the um, 1,111 jetpacks that we had. And uh, in order to get into the sale for the AVAs, we're going to kind of do this in a few phases. And actually, now that we're talking about this, there's going to be some new information I'm going to say here. Um, you know, there's some details around the Mint that we've not released. And I'm not going to say the Mint price yet either, because that's still something that we're finalizing. You know, it's an interesting time in the market. Um, things change quite rapidly. We're not really, really looking at things like the price of ETH. We're really looking at, you know, volumes in the secondary and kind of how Mints are doing right now. We want to do something that's successful, obviously, um, that makes a splash in the space, but also something that uh, you know, uh, is successful to people for the people that are minting. We've been very responsible with our mints. We've not done too many. We've been very careful. So that's the theme that we, we wish to continue here. Um, so phase one of the AVA mint is actually going to be an airdrop. So the first thousand or so AVAs are going to go to people that hold jetpacks. And this is really going to be the first thing that takes place. So, you know, the first 1,111 uh, AVAs are going to be delivered to every jetpack holder for free. So you're not paying for the mint, you're not paying for the gas. There's no claim. We will straight up drop drop them into your wallet. We will take all, absorb the cost for the gas, everything. Uh, jetpacks are very important to our ecosystem. You know, they're our genesis asset. And, you know, we're constantly thinking about what role they're going to serve in the future. And, you know, that's something that's a separate topic, but something that I'm really excited about. Jetpacks are not just going to be to fly in AR. They're going to really kind of be this really critical group of people in part of our world as we de develop it. Um, mm -hmm. The second phase of this uh, min is going to be uh, really uh, reserved for job holders. So, you know, everyone that has a jetpack and a hoverboard is going to be able to mint during the, this phase. So it's going to be open for a certain amount of time, certain amount of hours. Um, you know, we'll try to do something that touches various time zones and, you know, it doesn't stress people out too much. This is for our holders. This is for the job holders that, you know, are, is our community or active people that support us. You know, despite the bear market and everything, floors can be doing what they might be doing, but, you know, we only have, um, 2% of the supply listed for jetpacks and hoverboards. So and 98% of the people aren't even listing. You know, that's how in involved they are with what we're building. So this phase is in support of them. So in during this phase, no one else but Jolly Holders will be able to mint. And you know, uh, every Jolly Holder has at least one mint spot. Um, if you have a signature hoverboard, you have two spots. Um, and if you have a jetpack pro you have two spots. And if you have a trippy jetpack, you have three spots. So it's kind of, you know, uh, distributed differently across our assets. But uh, for the most part, every single job holder is going to be able to mint at least one. Um, and if you have multiple hub boards, you can mint uh, multiple. Now, this phase, um, you know, looking at the market, we expect that, um, you know, after this phase, still a lot of the AVAs will still be left because um, there are a lot more AVAs than there are hoverboards and jetpacks, and there are a lot more AVAs than there are total job holders. So this is kind of phase two. Now, phase three is the next step, which is something we've not really advertised or talked about much yet. Um, that's something that's on the horizon. We're going to promote it and start sharing it soon. But phase three is where our partner collections will be able to mint and participate. So, you know, all the partner collections from Fluffs to Dejans to, you know, Godfellas and uh, beyond, um, all the partner collections that participated in hoverboards and jetpacks, but also a bunch of new partner collections because, you know, part of our app release, which will be happening in a couple of months, is that we're actually adding a lot more communities to our ecosystem. So this will be an opportunity for other communities to participate within our ecosystem and, you know, get involved with also owning an AVA beyond the avatar that they're already using and, uh, you know, be able to participate in that way. So phase three is going to allow 
you know, a lot of these other communities to participate. Um, so that's kind of as, yeah, yeah go ahead. <laughs> no, sorry, I was just going to say, um, okay, well, thank you firstly for, for sharing that information. That That is some alpha, I, I would say. And just clarify it yeah. then for, for people. Say, say um, what about for people that are holding, say, a, if they had a, have a hoverboard and one of the, a fluff or uh, one of those other um, partner communities, will they be able to mint a, a second Ava, or are they all reserved for um, new uh, new community members from those partner communities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I'm not going to give a very definitive answer on this. I sure. think uh, we're working on a on an Ava release uh, minting website and everything that is going to have a lot of this stuff kind of broken down um, as we get down to really calculating how we think that this will unfold. Um, but for the most part, I think, uh, you know, uh, once again, like we're, we're, if you hold multiple assets in most scenarios, we are open to you being able to get multiple EVAs. Um, in fact, you know, once again, this is 11,000 is a large number. This is going to be the largest mint in a long time in this space. You know, in the last couple of months, we've not really seen a mint of this scale. So, you know, that's something that we really have in mind, something we're prepping for. Yeah, well, you know, let's talk about that briefly then, I said, you know, let's... Um, uh, well, from a lot of people's perspective, and well, this is just, you know, my opinion, but I imagine a lot of people uh, have kind of a, a similar feeling at the moment. So if we are in this kind of uh, crypto bear market, and obviously uh, NFTs are, are just, if not more, uh, affected. Um, but, you know, in some respects, it's, it's good for teams that have uh, enough runway, enough capital, enough resources. It gives them a little bit of space. Uh, to keep building uh, the pressure cooker is off a little bit but of course you know it, it, it is hard when if you're a new team or you're trying to do a new mint because there just isn't uh, the same level of interest and what a lot of people tend to do is maybe they just kind of um, like I, I just kind of pulled back on on my own uh, NFT activity and just kind of keep it restricted to to one or two ecosystems, um, you know. And Jadu would would probably be one of them. Do you do you think uh, that is probably uh, a fair assessment of how um, a lot of people are, are feeling at the moment? Yeah, I think that's absolutely a fair assessment. Um, I think. Uh... You know, if you look at the volumes we're seeing on a daily basis, um, it's a very different situation than it was a couple months ago. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Um, you know, despite ETH being down, that's kind of a thing on top of everything, right? Um, volumes by themselves are way lower and vents. I think the way people treat mints is very different. I think it's a bit more realistic too. Um, I, I feel like we were truly in a euphoric moment before this where things would sell out in seconds and, you know, the kind of euphoria around trying to get on lists and whatnot. I, I do think that that has changed. And I don't think that's too much of a bad thing either, honestly. Um, I think we need to learn how to operate in these kind of climates because um, I don't think it's actually realistic in the long term to expect uh, audiences to be as, um, you know, euphoric around mints as they used to be. Um, uh, so having said that, I think it's important that uh, one considers, um, you know, the the benefit of their stakeholders and, you know, community members and people that are going to be participating. I think it's important that uh, mints are not exploitative. Um, I think uh, it makes, definitely it makes it challenging for a lot of newcomers, but, you know, the position we are in is we're very lucky that, um, you know, we have a community that really absolutely is engaged with what we are doing and what we're building. and. Uh, I think that one of the most critical indicators of this is uh, the level of engagement and activity that we see within our community, um, despite prices uh, being lower and ETH being lower. Um, these are people that are here because they actually really love what is happening. They, they love showing up. They love the relationships they've built. They love being involved with something that's larger than them. They love having a passion and a purpose, um, you know, in a time where it's hard for people to have passions and purpose. Um, so we, we feel very lucky to have that. And that's something we want to continue to nourish. Um, having said that, um, you know, the approach that we're taking with this Mint is, you know, we haven't released the Mint price or the date. Um, you know, we keep saying it's end of August and 
you know, we have full intentions for it to happen end of August, even if it's the last day of August, um, we're really pushing for that. Um, and right now we're still five weeks away at least. And right now our approach is we can do this. It's a positive approach. It's an approach is like, this is a relatively large mint. It would be an exceptional mint if it happens at the scale that we're hoping for it to. Um, but in order to do exceptional things, you need to first believe that you can do them and you know work towards them. Um, having said that, as we get closer to it, we're going to take a very realistic approach. We're not going to put people in a position where you know they're going to be absorbing a lot of risk uh, on our behalf. We're really going to uh, do this in a way that um, is beneficial to everyone. So um, the, there are a few ways in which we can do this. One is what happens with the money that is made from the mint. Um, we are at this point a reasonably well-funded company. Uh, we have good enough runway to keep going for two and a half to three years. Um, we have a large team that is building the AR, is supporting the platform. We have all our plans are not reliant on this mint, right? If we make zero dollars from this mint, we still continue to do what we're doing. And so money isn't really the primary purpose here. So we are very actively working right now on really figuring out the money that comes in from this mint. How does it go back into supporting the community that's still with us? And that's that's a really critical thing for us. And you know, I won't get into exactly what that means yet because that's also something we'll be releasing more about. But something we're really that's that's an important part of this mint. The money is not gonna just support Jadu; it's gonna support the community in very tangible ways. Um, the second thing is obviously the mint price. Um, we, we're going to make sure that we arrive at a place where we feel very confident that you know the secondary market will be able to support it in, in a way that would benefit our holders. And um, the third piece is in the, the, in the scenario that we can't mint out the entire 11,000 item collection, we will absolutely have a fallback solution um, it's not going to be burn the stuff, just like how a lot of people seem to be doing that. We're not going to burn the stuff because 11,000 is a very critical number for us. So <clears throat> we're definitely going to create at least 11,000 of these guys. Um, however, there are a lot of other very interesting ways that we're currently exploring in which, you know, the AVAs that don't end up being minted in case that scenario occurs, um, end up inside uh, our world in AR in ways that you know people can access them later um and i think there's some really exciting scenarios that can unfold there yeah ai powered uh npcs but um uh, to be honest uh as i said i just can't see you having uh that as an issue that you have to deal with um you know i think um the the avas themselves from the the teasers that you guys have released uh yeah, I just think they're um, already interesting and compelling enough that I'd be incredibly surprised uh, if, if, if that mint uh, did not uh, sell out. But anyway, we will just have to uh, wait and, and see how uh, that plays out. Um, yeah, interesting market. Uh, just a couple of things I just wanted to quickly finish off this part of the podcast you know um you, you talked uh, said about you know the um the community and and the the fact that you know people are still around and they're still on the discord and and they still uh believe in, in what you guys are doing which i think speaks to probably the the quality of your team uh and the in the community itself and you know i i loved that um if it seems like uh, i guess it was two three four weeks ago already now but um nft and, and uh, NFT NYC, um, the the NFT conference in, in New York a little while ago, and you guys uh, had a big presence there. Wasn't there myself? I'm stuck down in here in New Zealand. But I, I loved that you guys. It seemed like you threw this massive disco party, and you did a collab uh, with Elton John. Shout out Elton John. Um, yeah, I, I love that. looked uh, looked like an incredible disco party. Um, fun for all the community, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, I have to give a shout out to uh, Bob TFD, our head of community, because, you know, it was really his idea and he led the whole project. I was initially quite nervous about it, to be honest, because I was like, wow, really, we're going to throw an event to the sides already. I don't know if we, we can do that with, you know, Ava's coming up and the app and, you know, a lot. We have a large team, but they're sp we're spending a lot of time building things we're building. And um, you know, James really uh, led this project and it ended up being really uh, amazing, honestly, like seeing people come together in real life and 
you know, I was once again unsure how it's going to turn out and, you know, what kind of people will show up. But, you know, it was really exciting to see what the community looks like in real life. You know, it's a lot of people that are doing interesting things with their life that, you know, come from all kinds of different backgrounds. I feel like we're, we're really attracting, you know, we have Pakistanis in the community. We have like, uh, you know, people from a lot of different parts of the world that are honestly paying attention uh, to what's happening. And so following the New York event, we actually last week held an event in LA, um, uh, you know, where we invited a bunch of local community members for uh, our first supper club. And that ended up being a really lovely time, honestly. Um, you know, we got to really spend a lot of very personal time with a lot of holders and talk to them about their lives and the difference that, you know, everything we're doing has made and, you know, the kind of uh, purpose and uh, community that, you know, that they're now able to access. And that was really, honestly, very lovely. We uh, held this dinner in kind of a, in a wood shop in Venice um, where you have kind of big, CNC machines cutting wood and, you know, the, 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 all the plates and spoons and forks were, were different, wasn't all one set. It's kind of this pop-up uh, scenario that we did. It had a really homely vibe to it. All the food was served in kind of family style and everyone really got to talk and meet and connect. And that was really lovely. And um, since we did that, it's inspired a lot of people to host job events all across, across the world. Uh, there is one coming up in Amsterdam. There's one coming up in Lahore, Pakistan. And we are actually helping support these events by providing grants uh, to local community members to put this stuff together. So once again, you know, like this community element is absolutely core to everything that we're building, um, you know, and uh, seeing it actually unfold in the real world in various places is once again, very much connects to the vision of the AR element that we have. I love it. All right. Well, uh, just before we go to a break and then we'll come back, we'll have some fun. We'll finish off with the very famous crypto conversation, hot take round. But um, I've just got to try one more time. I uh, said so for people that are still listening here towards the end of the show, uh, what else can you just kind of hint at in terms of uh, the future, um, I don't know, metagame, Miraverse, uh, you know, the, whatever the vision uh, for the future is that you guys are building and uh, the way that Avis uh, will be able to interact with uh, within this world. I know you can't give too much away, but just uh, anything you can hint at uh, for now. Yeah, absolutely. And this is kind of where I start giving things away. <laughs> and, um, you know, this is deep enough in the conversation where things start slipping. So, um, you know, one thing I would say is that the, we're, the way we're planning things out, once you have an AVA, you're going to get a bunch more stuff um, that you're not going to have to pay for. Um, that is something we're not really advertising right now. We're not saying, hey, get an AVA and get like a million airdrops. Um, but, you know, once you get an AVA and you're in our ecosystem in that way, um, a lot of the next items that Jada is going to be releasing, um, you're going to win them, not pay for them uh, as part of our world. And um, so as we release this app, um, really, it kind of has these two modes. We're not really breaking it down into these two modes necessarily, but you kind of have your open-ended you know, the play mode or create mode the way that we've had before, where you bring in your avatar and you can write, you have a board and your jetpack and other forms of assets and run around, make videos, you know, and try to make it look like your fluff is getting a drink in the bar or your dead fellow is jumping on a wall or, you know, uh, all those kinds of aspects. Um, but then there's a new mode, if you may, that we're building that is really core to everything we're going to be doing. And you can kind of think of it as a story mode. Right. So this is where you have various chapters. So there's going to be kind of a timeline associated with each avatar that you're using to play in the app. And this is not just for Avis. This, this is going to apply to any kind of compatible avatar that you have in the app. So, you know, your fluff's going to have a timeline. Now, these chapters um, are going to be released over time. So, you know, you're going to start with the prologue. And then a couple of weeks later, chapter one is going to come out. A couple of weeks later, chapter two is going to come out. Chapter three is going to come out. And really, we have this first season, which is composed of a few chapters. Um, and in this first season, we have certain themes and certain ideas we're going to be exploring with our audience. 
So every few weeks, you're going to have a new chapter that you're going to be able to play in AR. And each chapter, as I said, is going to be exploring new themes. So you might have a chapter that you know uh, is more narrative and story oriented, where you might meet an NPC who you might have a conversation with, who might tell you something about this world that you're not yet aware of and might give you a task that you have to complete. Um, as you complete this task, you might get an item that is an NFT um, that can be used in AR and you don't have to pay for it. You just had to you know, complete the chapter to access it. And there are gonna be various chapters of this nature. Uh, another chapter may not be story oriented at all. It might actually be a lot more focused on mobility and parkour and tricks and style points, right? So we're building these chapters that are all attempting something new, something new in AR that hasn't been attempted before. And the primary purpose is to see what works, to see what sticks, to see what people like. Um, one mistake that we're not making is assuming we know what the end game is. There, there, to us, there's no one end game. There's no one game loop. This is an evolving world. It has to be built in an evolving iterative fashion, especially considering how new this medium is. So that's kind of our approach with chapters. Uh, despite them being all different, they're gonna be connected by a couple of things. They're gonna be connected because they're gonna be exploring the story world in somewhat of a linear fashion. Each time with each chapter, the story expands and continues. And they're all gonna be connected because they're gonna be leading you to assets that are connected you know, uh, in-game NFT items that serve a purpose that work together. And that's really what's gonna give this whole thing cohesion. And as we end, come to the end of season one, we're gonna be gearing up for season two. And with each season, we're gonna have a larger theme we're gonna be exploring. So for season one, we're exploring uh, this idea of an avatar, playable avatar character in your world, in your room. With season two, um, aspirationally, we intend to explore multiplayer. That's something we're really doing a lot of work on in the background. And, you know, obviously, uh, we need to uh, kind of prove a lot more assumptions before this is something I can promise publicly. But that's aspirationally what we're hoping for, is that the form of multiplayer AR that we're playing with is to a point where season two can really, you know, immerse people in a form of multiplayer AR that they've never seen before. Wow, uh, incredibly exciting. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that. Uh, just two, two quick questions on, on this. So just a, a, a rough timeline for when you see uh, season one uh, perhaps taking place. And also, how does it work in terms of, uh, so, you know, these uh, this kind of uh, storytelling, immersive AR, Ava powered um, experience. Uh, it is possible to engage in that from anywhere in the world, whether you're in Pakistan, New York, or Australia, or New Zealand. How does that work? Yeah. So, um, in terms of timelines, right, uh, we're aiming for end of August for Ava Mint, and I would give it another month or so till the release of the app. And when the, the app releases, season one kind of begins. Um, the release of the app is going to contain all the features people were used to before. Um, but it's in a completely fresh new app now that loads instantaneously, that scans your surroundings quickly, that brings in an avatar. And, you know, it's uh, really quick and effective and has the beginnings of the story mode. So you're going to, you're going to, be able to meet your avatar for the first time in a, a dramatic story oriented way as part of this release and then every couple of weeks we're going to be aiming to get a new chapter out a, a new chapter out and that's going to be something that uh, progresses and continues over time uh, in terms of access um you your location does not matter um you know you're going to be able to access the app from anywhere on the planet um the app's going to be available on Android and iOS. So, you know, Android is obviously a new thing that we're working on right now. Um, you know, I cannot promise what exact devices it will work on, but we're really aiming uh, to make it available to as many people as possible. And there are gonna be some rest restrictions, obviously, in terms of the, the gameplay. Uh, our purpose with this release is not to find mainstream success. I think that is, uh, if that was the purpose, I think that that would be somewhat delusional. I, I think it would 
absolutely require alienating our holders in order to get that mainstream appeal because you've got to pick and choose you know you can't do everything at the same same go so right now the purpose with this release is to engage our holders our community you know the extended community through partner collections and really like have a relatively smaller tight audience that is absolutely obsessed with this you know not to have a bunch of casual people it's to have an audience that plays every chapter that can't wait for the next thing that's you know like leading up to a new chapter is speculating and imagining that's what we're excited about right now and the learnings we're going to get with building for you know a super fan audience like this is going to teach us the things that are going to work for a larger mainstream audience as well and that's something that's going to start to become our goal probably in a year from now uh, when we will have a lot of these pieces in place and we were ready to be go out to millions of people. Um, that's how we're treating it. Awesome. Sounds incredibly exciting. I am here for it. I can't wait. Bring on the Avers. All right, let's uh, let's go to a very quick break and then we'll come back. We'll finish off. We'll have some fun. We'll run us through the very famous crypto conversation hot take round. All right, let's go to a very quick break and then we will be right back to run us through the very famous crypto conversation hot take round. And boom, uh, we are back. And if you've been watching on YouTube, well, we've probably been here all along. I may even have said that twice, but that is all good. All right. I said, as you probably know, I like to finish each podcast with a quick round of rapid fire crypto conversation hot takes. Are you up for it? Let's do it. All right, let's do it. Just going to run some questions at you. Some of them are yeah, they're slightly crypto centric. Some are not. Uh, but just give me um, yeah, quick rapid answers, hot take style. Question one, bit of a funny one. But um, where would you say is it that you sit on the Bitcoin maximalist uh, to multi chain opportunist spectrum? <laughs> Um, yeah, I definitely say I'm way more towards the multi-chain opportunistic uh, scenario in this case. Yes. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. All right. Well, what would you say um, is your firmest conviction uh, crypto opinion? Um, I am clearly sticking by ETH to a good extent here. Um, yeah, I think... Uh, I think so far from what I've seen, Ethereum seems to be the place to be for a lot of reasons. And I'm really hoping that uh, with the merge and everything, um, you know, the concerns that one does have get hopefully resolved. Hey, makes sense to me. Uh, certainly one of the leading narratives at the moment, uh, the Ethereum merge. Um, but look, uh, Sid, Bill Gates famously said that we tend to overestimate uh, what we can accomplish in two years and underestimate uh, what we can accomplish in 10. And for someone who's building, building an uh, AR for some time, you'll be very familiar with this concept, I'm sure. Uh, but cast your mind forward. Uh, whatever you like here, you know, um, AR, VR, web3 the metaverse uh, but what does it all look like in 10 years time um you know once again aspirationally because uh, if i'm in this space i'm hoping for good things to come out of this and you know um i i really hope that some of the elements that we miss today in our lives um you know due to remote work and you know all kinds of new elements that didn't really exist a couple of years ago um, they, all these elements have a lot of pros and they have a lot of cons. And what I'm really hoping is that, you know, the network and the, inst the shared incentives and these kind of things that crypto is providing lead us to solutions to the things that are currently cons uh, out of this new setup that we live in. A bit of an abstract answer, but, you know, I'm hoping that people have new ways of, of forming identities, new ways of, you know, forming subgroups and subcultures and micro communities that, are very much in line with their interests that give them new forms of tradition and purpose, um, you know, and make their life exciting and passionate. I love it. I love it. Abstract is always good. Uh, the flip side of this, of course, is a quote by uh, sci-fi author William Gibson, who said that uh, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Um, with that in mind, I said, can you think of an example of the future being here right now? Uh, but most people just aren't really 
aware of it. Absolutely. Um, I think uh, exactly the future I just described, um, which I hope will be available to more people. I think that in some tiny forms, we, we have it right now. You know, we're uh, th these Discord communities and people that come together around different projects and whatnot. I think that there truly are a precursor um, to this future that I was describing earlier, where people in their imaginations, these worlds already exist. You know, one might say, hey, like, you know, where is the Mirrorverse or where is, you know, the fluff world or where, you know, where is it tangibly? Is it VR? Is it the SAP? Is it, I do think these places have started already existing. You know, they, they exist the same way. Um, the fantastical worlds of, you know, fiction and movies and have existed in people's minds. Um, they exist in our collective imagination. Yeah. Uh, that is exactly right. And uh, speaking of, I guess, um, yeah, our collective imagination. Uh, time to zoom out, uh, time to start to get weird as we start to finish off. What do you see as the long-term future for the human race? Uh, so do you see a dystopia or utopia? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that, you know, uh, uh, it as cheesy as it sounds, I do think that these are somewhat um, false binaries. Um, I do think uh, it's going to be a mixture. They're going to be good things. They're going to be bad things. It's just going to be different. And, um, you know, uh, I think uh, a big part of it, hopefully, is going to involve people being able to be whatever they want, honestly. Um, I think that the future will involve people living out their lives as a dragon, if they so intend to. And I think that's all right. I think that a lot of the world that we currently perceive and, you know, the way we think of objective truth is uh, it's very vague. We, we know very little about our world. And I think that leaning in on that sometimes is not such a bad thing. I love that. I think that, that is one of the best ways to to think about the future. Um, if, if, if you want to live out your life as a dragon, then boom, simple as that. And uh, yeah, I like that a lot. Let's start to close this out. I said, uh, finally, can you share uh, what is one of your favorite science fiction uh, books, films, uh, TV shows, or universe? Um, so uh, this is uh, probably going to be somewhat surprising to you, but I'm really not a huge on science fiction. Um, I, uh, you know, a lot of my friends are, uh, a lot of people in my team, you know, spend a lot of time reading all kinds of science fiction books and watching a lot of movies. Um, I have never been that interested in some of these uh, imagined uh, realities. Um, I think a lot of the time I've spent is actually imagining, you know, my own version of uh, this form of future. And I think the type of future I imagine is a lot more tied into um, you know, how humans already do things and, um, you know, are um, just looking at things that I hope um, get to be more and more uh, involved with how we live. And yeah, I would say, um, uh, you know, regardless, talking about fictitious worlds, um, you know, um, I think uh, a lot of the folk stories uh, of where I come from in Pakistan, um, you know, inspire a lot of the a lot of the same feelings I want my work to over time inspire. Um, a lot of the folk stories that you know uh, I grew up around are actually tied very specifically to space. You know, it's like this fairy and this this you know prince came together around this lake, and you go visit the lake, and you know there there's a lake called Sefal Maluk, and there are these stories about the fairies of this lake that you know, a, a man that sits by the fire next to the lake tells every night and a lot of tourists go and sit by him and he tells them the story. And, you know, uh, I, I do think that, you know, that's a version of the future that's exciting where places capture history and story and culture that, you know, they then uh, radiate out. Yep. I love that. Yes, indeed. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, futuristic sci-fi or traditional folk stories. Uh, really, it is all 
uh, human storytelling and uh, just humans uh, using their imagination to uh, understand uh, this wonderful state that we call a reality. But we come to the end of the show. Uh, so this has been excellent. It's been fun. Thank you so much uh, for coming on the show. Uh, time uh, to hand the metaphorical microphone back to your good self. Please tell the people uh, where they can go to find you on Twitter or wherever else uh, you like to hang out on the internet. And of course, um, please just, again, if people want to uh, perhaps mint themselves an Ava, uh, where they should go to learn more about that and, uh, and how they can do so. All that good stuff, please. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, Twitter is really the ideal place to learn about a lot of this stuff right now. Um, you know, we post there, um, we post there every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, that's kind of the our cadence, um, you know, when the rest of it, we're kind of retweeting and engaging, but really Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we make sure to post something that feels exciting, something that, you know, feels really delightful to our audience. Uh, we don't regurgitate anything. We always have something fresh to put out. We often run giveaways with almost everything we post uh, to make it exciting and give people a call to action. So Twitter is really a great place, um, you know, to follow us. And, you know, Instagram is something where it's starting to wrap up as well. And Discord is really where the community is. So, you know, if you want to get involved and speak to people and, you know, our mod, mod team is very active. You want to reach out to me, um, you know, reach out on Discord. We can, we have a help desk section where we, you can start a new ticket and someone from the team can come on. Sir. Um, we're very hands on with our community. Um, you know, with some, when someone has a marriage in their family or a death in their family, they come and talk about it in um, our Discord. We send flowers when people have, you know, a funeral. We send onesies when people have a kid. Like we're very, hands-on with our community and just make sure, you know, that everyone feels like they're part of something bigger. And so I would encourage you to uh, join there. Um, and in terms of the Ava Mint itself, um, you know, obviously purchasing a hoverboard or jetpack is kind of the guaranteed way to get into the Mint. And, um, you know, these are obviously really important assets to us that will be a really important part of how we're uh, going to be developing out our community over time. So thank you. Awesome. Uh, we'll leave it there. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sid. Uh, thank you for coming on the show. All the best and bye for now. Yeah. All right. There you go. Jadu. That was Sid from Jadu. Um, yeah, very cool. Uh, I enjoyed that. Um, yeah, no, I think they're doing really cool things and, and Web3 uh and the metaverse nfts ar uh of course i probably would say that because i am lucky enough to own a jadu hoverboard uh so yeah i've been uh, kind of keeping keeping watch on on the community and um yeah i just think uh the jadu community is certainly one of the more interesting uh web3 communities so simple as that really um but if you have not seen uh, the Avas in action, uh, as I think I've said once or twice during this podcast, do encourage you to go uh, to the Jodu Twitter and have a little look. I'll put a, a link to uh, to the Jodu website and Twitter, of course, in the show notes. Anyway, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Um, don't forget to subscribe to the Crypto Conversation podcast in whatever podcast app you are using. But for today, we're out of here. Thanks for listening, team. This was the Crypto Conversation for Brave New Coin. See ya.